a reading from the book of Sirach. Wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner hugs them tight. The vengeful will suffer the Lord's vengeance, for he remembers their sins in detail. Forgive your neighbor's injustice, then when you pray, your own sins will be forgiven. Could anyone nourish anger against another and expect healing from the Lord? Could anyone refuse mercy to another like himself? Can he seek pardon for his own sins? If one who is but flesh cherishes wrath, who will forgive his sins? Remember your last days. Set enmity aside. Remember death and decay and cease from sin. Think of the commandments. Hate not your neighbor. Remember the Most High's covenant and overlook faults. The word of the Lord. not treat us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our faults. Our Lord is kind and merciful, so
a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, none of us lives for oneself, and no one dies for oneself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. The word of the Lord. Dominus Fabiscum, Ecum Spiritus Tuo, Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteum, Gloria Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him and owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of giving it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized them and started to choke him, demanding, pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his servant, his fellow servant begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had the fellow servant put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply, deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had, had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you, unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. Verbum do homini.
We must uh, forgive one another from the heart, the gospel tells us today. And the only way we can do that is if we have a new heart, a new transformed heart. And that's what Jesus came to do, to give us this total transformation that, not, that aims not just at exterior observance, practice of our religion, but this inner renewal, this inner transformation, the both and, he wants the whole person, but something's got to really change in us. The second reading today, Romans 14, Paul says, none of us lives for oneself, and if we live, we live for the Lord. We're taking on receiving this life of Christ. Our lives are not our own. We're given ourselves over to the Lord to be transformed. We're given a new life in Jesus Christ. To Nicodemus, Jesus tells him, unless one is born anew, he cannot, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some translations say, unless he's born from above by the Holy Spirit, by baptism in the Holy Spirit, he's born from above, made new. John the Baptist would say, he must increase, I must decrease. Ephesians 4, put off the old man that belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new man created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off the old man with all his corruption and deceit Living a Christian life is an experience of becoming a new man. And some of us in the church witness to this in such a powerful way. Some of us have a, a deep experience of wanting something better, something more. Our sins and attachments beat us to death. But this tired world and fallen human nature cannot deliver what our hearts long for, our deepest yearnings, because we want more. We want transformation. Our culture and the very air we breathe continually shouts, perfect yourself, perfect yourself, just on this level of natural dispositions. But we have to get to that point that vices can be overcome, they cannot be overcome by human force alone, by human effort alone. Dietrich von Hildebrand writes beautifully about this transformation. You know, sometimes the culture, you know, we're just trying to avoid carbs today, right? <laughs> we're not thinking on a deeper level of trying to, to become Christ. In the Old Testament, Judaism has such a deep understanding of our brokenness, of our realism. The first reading Sirach says, wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner hugs them tight. Why do we do that? Wrath and anger, hatred? Yeah, we're holding them tight. We hold on to our vices and stuff so tightly. There's something broken, fallen about us. We see clearly in the Old Testament the wound of original sin. The book of Genesis, chapter 3, right? We fell from grace, we failed to obey God. We see right off the bat the murder of Abel by his brother Cain. We see wars and violence, lusts throughout the Old Testament, failure to live the covenant in the desert before they even get to the promised land. <laughs> At the foot of Sinai, they're given the Ten Commandments, we have the golden calf. There's something just that needs there's a brokenness that needs to be transformed in us. And we underestimate our weakness and our situation. You know, left unaided reason, which we champion so much today, we can lie to ourselves so easy. It's, it's, it's led us to terrible conclusions in our human history. Just look at the 20th century. The blood shed that was shed, shed, the blood that was shed during that century is just staggering. What 
When God looks for us in the garden, as Pope Francis said, you know, he says, where are you? Where are you? What evil have you done? That even God might, you know, in a, in a way that's uh, anthropomorphic, but say, you know, what evil? What evil are we possible of, are we capable of? We do not need, we do not merely need to get better, though. We need redemption. We have a darkened intellect, a weakened will, a tendency to sin, a tendency to sin. We, our, our car wants to drive into the ditch continuously. We need redemption. We need holiness. We need a complete transformation. And this is incurable by human means. We cannot erase our moral guilt. You know, in our culture today, we're in a constant state of distraction, of activity, of having more, consuming more. We need to become totally new, to give ourselves over to Christ, like the Blessed Mother. She gives her fiat, let it be done to me according to thy word, that she believes the words of the angel and gives her obedience. She goes to help Elizabeth immediately after that. That obedience is key. Paul, you know, in, in, letter, in Romans, he starts speaking about obedience and it ends with obedience. He's trying to bring about this obedience of faith that we have to, to live it and, and that's transforming us as we, as we obedient to God's will in our life. And yes, does this mocked by the world? Most definitely. First Corinthians, Paul says, we are fools for Christ. The saints were considered foolish in the eyes of the world. St. Philip Neri would even want to make that point. He would do crazy things, right? <laughs> he would dress in ridiculous ways. He would shave half his beard. He'd be considered a, a buffoon just to trample upon you know, the accolades of the world. Do we have a willingness to accept humiliations? Or do we so value the opinions of others, the standards of the world? Boy, if we can just close our mouths and just silently accept humiliations in our life. Dietrich von Hildebrand would write of a that we need to make a total breach with the world and its standards. We see in the Gospels, Jesus calling apostles and disciples to follow him. Come, follow me. And this is a particular call. You know, they dropped their nets, right? They left everything to live these evangelical councils. Again, Hildebrand would write that we're not... You know, that's a particular call for some. He said, but the Christian is merely required to relinquish his old self, the natural foundation and all purely natural standards, and open himself entirely to Christ's action. <laughs> to let go of the old self and embrace this new in Christ. In Mark's gospel, these are the first words of Jesus to repent and believe in the gospel. To repent, to turn from ourselves. Metanoia is the Greek word. And it's not just something that happens at baptism where original sin is wiped away, but it's a daily act, a continuous act to change, to change one's mind and one's life. You know, to feel a regret, a remorse, to be sorry for our sins and to turn to the Lord. And it's a complete turning, the interior and the exterior man. You know, we're called as Christians to do some form of penances and self-denials to make it real, but to turn to God with our whole self. As I mentioned, that you know, Christ is aiming at the transformation of the interior he wants to transform the heart. We see that clearly in the Sermon on the Mount. And yet he maintains the need for prayer and sacrifices to offer things up. We are to turn from ourselves and turn to God. Not just 
an attitude, but in an acts, you know, acts that we take every day to embrace Christ. And the forgiveness of sins is the beginning of all this, that we receive that forgiveness. That's the huge debt that's spoken of in the gospel today, in the parable, the huge debt that the man can't possibly pay back. There's no way that we can merit this forgiveness of sins, that we can earn it in some way. Seen clearly in that, that first grace of baptism, we can't merit that. That's the beginning. It's a gift. It's received in gratitude. And if we have that humility and gratitude, and then we can give it to others in humility from the heart, from a transformed heart that cancels the debt. Sometimes when we're hurt, you know, we want that pound of flesh back. We want something. We hold it against them. Just let that go. Cancel that debt because a, a much bigger debt has been canceled in our life by Jesus Christ. He ransomed us from death through his sacrifice on the cross. I'm free, right? I'm free. I'm set free. You know, that he has given his life so that we might have ours by his stripes. You know, we were healed. How can I then turn around and hold that against someone else for a much smaller debt against me? And I like to think of it personally. I mean, Jesus is clearly placing it in the context of our eternal salvation. You know, in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's necessary for us to, in our receiving forgiveness, we must forgive others. But it just it makes this life bearable. When I hold on to that, those offenses from others, and I focus on that, my world gets really small. I'm just focused on that. I take my eyes off the Lord and that new life he is giving us, that new life we are called to embrace. It's a much better way to live. It's a new freedom a new joy, a new peace.